Welcome back to the Salmon River Fish Hatchery, where we're again doing egg collection. We are taking coho eggs today. Last week we were taking Chinook eggs, or also known as the King Salmon. Today we're on Silvers or Cohos. And through the channel over here, we have staff crowding in the fish to push them in, to bring them down to our baskets, where they will slide into the baskets. Once they're in the baskets, they'll hang out for a couple of minutes getting some extra carbon dioxide so that they'll calm down. It's kind of like getting anesthesia during a surgery, just before surgery, so you'll calm down. Our fish will hang here for two to three minutes with anesthesia, the carbon dioxide in the water. They run about five to eight pounds on average when we get them here at the hatchery. Both of these are Pacific salmon. They were brought here to the Great Lakes to help solve an imbalance with the prey species after our native top predator fish were um, not doing well because of habitat loss and dams on the rivers. And we had too many prey species, which were alewives, found in the Great Lakes. In the 50s, the alewives species were washing up on shores in knee-high dead piles. And you, as you can imagine, they did not smell well and not many people would want to go swimming in that kind of situation. So we had two major problems to fix. Too many prey species and alewives dying and washing up on shore. So we tried to bring in the Chinook salmon that ate a lot of fish in one year and the coho salmon. But we did not figure in to this problem the sea lamprey, which is a parasitic fish that attaches to the sides of large predator fish and literally, like a vampire, sucks out the blood and life juices of the, the large fish. So once we figured out that we had both of those problems to solve, scientists figured out a lampicide which is used in the tributaries. Um, the sea lamprey juveniles, the larvae of the sea lampreys, will live in tributaries for up to 17 years. So we do a, every third year, we treat the tributaries where we know sea lamprey populations spawn. And that has taken care of the sea lamprey population. There are still some out there, but the Erie Canal had brought so many in to the Great Lakes that they needed to be taken care of. So by the 60s, late 60s, when we still were st trying to stock these Pacific salmon to help with the alewife population. They were doing well and they were helping take care of the alewife population. And by the 70s and 80s, they were a terrific sport fishery. And that's how in the eight, 1980 and 81, we built this Salmon River Fish Hatchery here in Altmar. So now one of the baskets is coming up and we'll shift locations so we can watch the sorting. So we sort fish. You can still see the elevator coming up. It's going to dump the fish out onto the sorting table where our staff will sort it. They will sort by species because we only take eggs from one species at a time. Today is coho, so anything else goes back down some of these tubes. Basically think of a... I'll let them fall because they're loud. So we sort by species first. Anything else goes basically on a water slide ride back outside to our holding ponds. Then coho are sorted by readiness to spawn, which most of them are. Then they are sorted by males versus females. Females go in this large rectangular tank and males go in the green tanks over to the left. Sometimes you can notice the 
Males of the cohos have that nice pink coloration. And for those of you who were a little worried that we might not have a lot of fish, as you can see, we have plenty. There's still some Chinooks in our crowding channel. Some of these fish are anywhere from two years old to three or four years old. They spend one to three years up in, the, in Lake Ontario before they come back. Sometimes they uh, like to come back a little early and they're not quite ready, but they all die after spawning. As soon as they enter the river, their bodies start to change and they are not gonna go back. These are Pacific salmon, so they do die after spawning. So as soon as they start to come into this river, their bodies are going through a chemical process and changing. We're gonna do one more sorting that's the second elevator starting to come up. Again, it goes by species, readiness to spawn, and then male versus female. As the next basket comes up, people are asking, what do we do with the fish after we spawn the eggs out of them and take the milt? And I will get to that in a few minutes as we go through the process. As our staff sorts through them, they will take numbers and counts of the females and males, mostly just the females, because we need to know how many females we're processing. For when we do an egg count later. All right, so we're done sorting. If you look in the back corner to the right of the blue garbage can. You will see our regional biologists taking fish samples and population. They're doing a population study on our cohos. They are, one is doing a wand. It's a metal detector for looking for um, chips in the head. The other is taking length, weight, and scale samples so that we can make sure that our, we know what our population is doing. You can actually take the age of a scale sample. Just like the rings of a tree, you can get the average or estimated age by looking at the rings of a scale sample. So as we start the process for coho, these fish do die naturally during the spawning process. To keep our staff safe, they just made it through hundreds of thousands of fishermen. There are hooks in these bodies. Our blue box of death fits our Chinook salmon. They don't always fit our coho salmon. That's the blue box with the SI5. So we do have staff who are using a gold bat to dispatch and euthanize our coho salmon for the safety of ourselves and for the safety of the fish. In orange, our hatchery manager here at the Salmon River Fish Hatchery is taking the eggs out of the coho female. You notice that there will be two females in one bin. Coho salmon have about 2,000 the female has about 2,000 eggs per female. So there's about 4,000 eggs in the bin after the two females are in there. And then Andy's gonna have to move over here. We use about four or five males per two females to ensure fertilization. Then we add a little bit of water to start the fertilization process. Then they'll hang out to make sure they get fertilized. So again, it's two females in the tub of eggs, so it's about 4,000 eggs. 
compared to two females of the Chinook from last week, which is about 8,000 to 9,000 eggs, two cohos, because they are smaller, are about 4,000 eggs. To about four or five males, again, we add water to start fertilization process, and then they sit for a couple of minutes. The eggs are, um, so as, as they sit and wait, then they will be rinsed out, and then they will have a bath in B1 thiamine, because owlwives, once they get out into Lake Ontario, have thiaminase, which prevents them from really getting B1 in their system as they grow. So we give them a B1 booster shot, kind of like taking your vitamins in the morning. After they spend about two hours in a B1 bath, they get a 15 minute disinfection with iodine before they even enter the hatchery. So we're in the spawn house right now, which is a separate facility from our hatchery system. They go into the hatchery after disinfection so that there's no diseases entering our hatchery. Once the eggs are hanging out, after they've been disinfected, they will hang out in these batch incubators, basically the high-tech garbage pails you'll see in the back after we start the rinsing process in a minute. For about, until they start eyeing up, which is roughly about 30 days, so at about Thanksgiving, We'll start moving them to trays. And they'll spend time in tray incubators till they start hatching out at about Christmas time when they become sac fry, which are, they kind of look like fish, but they have a yolk sac attached to them, and that's what they're eating. And then at about New Year's, about three months, they become swim up fry. If you notice, every once in a while, our hatchery manager dumps a few eggs. That's because they're not ready. They're too hard to fertilize. And it's all about the timing of eggs. So in the back, you'll notice we are rinsing the eggs out now. They've been through the couple of minutes to really do the fertilization process. They're fertilized now. They're being rinsed out from any stuff that was left over from fish. We try to get them as clean as possible. Then they'll go in the batch garbage pails where they'll hang out in the two out for two hours in the thiamin B1. So, what do we do with the carcasses? After this process, we do end up with a lot of carcasses that cannot be donated to food banks or to pet food companies or for any other use. So what we do is we have a compost facility here on site where they're composted for about 12 to 18 months and turned into compost in a higher, a hotter situation than most normal backyard composting facilities. And they hang out here until they're fully composted. And then that compost is trucked down to the Pulaski Transfer Station where the public can come and grab it for flower beds and help increase their soil. So, the reason why we can't donate any of these fish to pet food companies or to um, food banks or anything is because we have, they spend their lives in Lake Ontario and they are a large predator fish. So their bodies pick up all of the contaminants and these contaminants bioaccumulate, which means they accumulate in the larger prey, predator fish. There's murex, PCBs, dioxins in Lake Ontario, just like a lot of the other Great Lakes. And the, Depart the New York State Department of Health has issued fish consumption advisories so that women of childbearing age and children 16 and under should eat none, and men 16 and years old and older can eat four meals a month four ounces or less. 
But again, check the Department of Health's website for fish, advi fish consumption advisories and ways to make, cook them to make them healthier to eat. Thank you guys for tuning in and we appreciate your time.